Okay, everyone ready? Hope you guys are well. I hope it's been a good two weeks. We've been off for two weeks, and uh, it's good to be back. So we are going to run full steam ahead in April. Um, there's four sessions left, including tonight, and we'll be ending on the last Monday of April. It will be our last session of TAC. You're eight weeks in. This is week nine, so there's been eight sessions. I hope you guys have been learning something. I hope the Lord has been stirring something in your heart. I hope the Lord is marking you for things that makes him excited because that's, that's what this is all about. Um, and then at the end of the trip, <clears throat> I was actually thinking about this while we were praying for our trip to Turkey now, is the, the team that we're going with was Connor's part-time mission school last year called GMS Global Mission School. Ours is called TSC, the sending company. And um, the team that we're going with now is the team that did GMS last year. And they're going to Turkey now. Now, they were more than 11. We're 11 that, that, that's going. Sorry. Um, I think we were about 20, 23. Can't remember. I think about 23. And out of the 23, almost half, so almost half of the team is going to, to Turkey um, now, like next week which is going to be awesome. So the fact that you are here means that the Lord is setting you up for something. You're going somewhere, even if you don't know where yet. It's okay, He knows. He's going to send you something somewhere. You're not here by chance, even if it is your first night. You're not here by chance. The Lord is definitely stirring something inside of your, inside of your heart. Okay. Great. So tonight's topic um, is about spiritual warfare. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Like I always say at our services, this is sausage um, iniki. I'm not going to, honestly, not going to go too deep into it. I might share some testimonies, um, share some personal things out of, out of my life and things that I've experienced in spiritual warfare. But the idea tonight is not to make you scared, <laughs> is not to awaken fear in your heart. Uh, the idea tonight is actually to come and equip you for what you guys are going to face the moment that you go into, into the nations, into regions, into different areas of the world, okay, which is definitely a, a reality. All right. So before we start, let's pray. Jesus, we want to thank you that we get to be a part of the victory team. If God is for us, who can be against us? And Lord, thank you that we know that everything is subject to you, everything is subject to your name, and we honor you for the fact that you are king. No one else is king above you. No one else is Lord above you. You are king. You are Lord. You are the ruler. You are the victorious one. You are the conquering one. You are the champion and the champion of champions. And tonight as we break open your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and enlighten us that you would come and equip us, that you would open up the scriptures for us. I pray that nothing that comes out of my mouth will be from myself, Lord, but that you would inspire this word, that you would inspire this teaching, and that you would come with your spirit and mark us with a boldness that we've never had before. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, hope you guys have your notebooks ready and your Bibles ready. There's a couple of scriptures, and I want you to read with me, because some of the scriptures are going to be a little bit long, um, and if you don't, if you're going to follow me and not read with me, it's, you're going to lose me. So it will be good if you read with me. We're, we're starting off with a short scripture, okay, just one verse, but there's going to be some long verses, long scriptures, okay? So we'll be starting off in Ephesians 6 verse 12, where we always start when it comes to spiritual warfare. And um, I'll read it now. Just before I uh, start there, I think it's very important for us to recognize the fight, okay? Recognize what we're busy with, recognize what we're dealing with. Paul comes in, in the book of, of Corinthians and he makes this statement. He says that we are not ignorant of the devil's devices, of the accuser's devices. So it's important for us as believers to not be ignorant. It's, it's important for us as believers to be informed to be equipped, to know, to have a knowledge, so that we can have a strategy, 
Okay? If, there, if there's no knowledge on this, if we're naive in this, we won't have a strategy. And we need a strategy when it comes to, to all of these things. Let me say this, that we are not going into Turkey without praying. We are not going into Turkey without fasting. We are not going into Turkey without spending a lot of time with the Lord. We are not that naive. We are not that stupid. Okay? There's a lot of planning, there's a lot of time spent, there's a lot of preparation that we do before we go into those regions, and even when we come back. There's strategic meetings that we have. I had a, a meeting with Wim Chris, who's our, our lead intercessor with this church, and I spoke to him about everything that's going to happen there. And I gave him information, and I asked him to mobilize people you know, around us, to pray with us, to intercede with us, to stand with us. Those things are super important because we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Okay? We are fighting against spiritual things. And the moment that we don't recognize this, we will hate people. If you, if you think that your fight is against the Turkish Muslims then you're going to hate the Turkish Muslims. Just out of my own life, I, I really struggled with, with um, Islamic people, with Muslim, Muslim people. After 9-11 that happened in, in 2001, I really had a, a hate inside of my heart for them because, because of their religion, because of their beliefs, because of jihad, because of everything that they do, because of their mercilessness, their audacity. I hated Muslims. Every time I saw them, there was this thing in my heart for them, you know, against them. Until I started spending time with the Lord. I never would have thought, never would have thought that the Lord would want to send me to, into the 1040 window, where the majority is Muslim. I never thought, I never thought that the Lord would want to use me in a nation like Turkey, which is 99.8% Muslim. It's the, the biggest Muslim country in the world. It's the most unreached country in the world, con comparing to the gospel of God. I never thought that. Okay? But the moment that I looked into his eyes, the moment that I realized how much he loves the people, was the moment that my heart started to, to change. It was, it was the moment that I started loving the people, started, started um, being convicted of, of the things that I believed against them. So I, I love the Muslim people, but I hate Islam, if that makes sense. Does it make sense to you? Okay. I love the people that practice the religion, but I hate the religion. Okay, I love it. Just think about what Tasha said yesterday when he was preaching. He said that the Lord has come in 2 Corinthians 5, and he said that we regard no one according to the flesh anymore. So the moment that we look at people, the moment that we, we meet with people, we actually see in them what Jesus sees in them. And that's what, what needs to happen. Okay, so Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So where are all these things, all these things that he just listed? In heavenly places. Heavenly places speaks of spiritual things. It's a spiritual place, which means that there's spiritual demarcations, spiritual regions, where these things operate, where these things are, are busy. And while I was reading this, I, I thought by myself, why is Paul reminding this church, this church, the church of Ephesians, why is he reminding them about this? Why isn't he reminding Corinthians, struggling with all this sin and all these, you know, issues? I mean, Ephesians didn't have issues. Corinthians had a lot of issues. Why, why Ephesians? And I felt the Holy Spirit take me back to... to um, Acts 1, obviously. Um, oh, sorry, Acts 19. But before we, before we get there, listen to what he also says to this church, okay? In verse 10 to 11 and verse 13, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the vials of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Why did Paul remind the church of this? 
I mean, they were in the middle of revival. They were seeing God's hand move. They were seeing thousands of people coming into the kingdom of God. They were seeing an influx of witchcraft, repenting, selling their books, um, coming into the kingdom of God. Why is he reminding them of this? At the moment that we read Acts 19, you'll actually see why Paul is talking to them about this. So this is where we're, we're reading a lot of Scripture. So please go with me to Acts 19 so that we can read from verse 23 until verse 41. It's going to be a lot of reading. You there? You guys with me? 19 verse 23. Acts 19, Handelinge, 19, 23. Okay, here we go. And at about, and about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. So you know that the Christians were called the way back then, right? For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed from all Asia and the world worship. Okay, so let's, let's just stop there, verse 28. We'll, we'll read from verse 28. Okay, so this guy stands up. He makes a big commotion. Paul is busy preaching, and as he's preaching, one of the temples uh, gets emptied out, and another temple gets filled. Okay, the, the synagogue of the Jews is getting filled with Christians, and the temple of Diana, or also called Artemis, is being decimated. It's, it's getting destroyed, basically. People are leaving, leaving the faith. So it is interesting, just for you, you guys to know, Artemis was the goddess of fertility and the goddess of love for the Greek mythology. Um, she was called Diana in Roman language. So in the Greeks, under the Greeks, she was known as Artemis. And under um, the Romans, she was known as Diana. So that's why this, this Bible refers to her as Diana. Now, she had an amazing, amazing big temple. We're actually going to the ruins there, see me, when we're going there now. Going to the ruins of the temple of Artemis. She had a big temple. The, pink, the temple was so big in Ephesus that they called it one of the seven wonders of the world. Okay, so it was the epicenter of the worship of this goddess, the epicenter of the worship of this demonic force in Ephesus. And one of the people that were getting rich through making her shrines, making idols from her and from the temple, for the temple and for the people, um, was starting to stir up a riot, was starting to stir up people against Paul because of what he was doing. It was 28. 28. And now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. That's like standing up and making a proclamation that there is no one like Jesus. Jesus is the highest God. Jesus is the highest king. Jesus is higher than Allah, Muhammad, Buddha, Socrates, whoever. Okay? That's the same. This is what they are doing. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord. We're actually going to that theater now. Sorry, I'm going to a We're going to the temple of Artemis and we're going to this theater that they're speaking about now. Um, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Okay? So... Sorry, I'm, I'm, I skipped a part. Verse 29 again. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius 
and Aristarchus, the Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the, peop into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Typical Paul. This guy just didn't have any fear inside of him. The whole city is rioting, getting together. That theater could hold 20,000 people. Today doesn't sound a lot. In those days, 20,000 people, that's the whole city getting together, shouting, great is Diana. I mean, these are people that are, have been converted as well to Christianity. Shouting, great is Diana of the, of the Ephesians. And they take captive two of Paul's companions, and Paul wants to rush in there to speak to the people. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, they're rioting. They want to kill these people, and he just wants to go in there. The disciples are just like, Paul, don't go. Just relax, buddy. Chill. Fata chill, Paul. Then one of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So the disciples keep him from going in, and then one of the city officials sent news to Paul, telling him, please don't go in, Paul. They're going to kill you. Okay? Fata chol, Paul. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. I think it feels as a spirit of confusion. What's, what's busy reigning over that nation, well, over that city? Even with that great temple, even with worship of you know, the epicenter of the worship of Artemis, there's such a spirit of confusion over the people's hearts. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Christians struggle to worship Jesus for two hours. And here they are shouting out for two hours one sentence, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. For two hours. I mean, we would be bored after five minutes. Now, when we worship and we, sh we declare the name of Jesus, after 10 minutes, we want to, okay, what's the next phrase? Holy Jesus, holy, oh, worthy, gee, worthy, because we're so stuck on, oh, I can't, you know? But these guys were just going after, after this thing. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesians, of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess, Diana? and the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. Okay, let's just read on, until there. So Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, telling them that our fight, our wrestle is not against fleshly people. That's why he had the mindset of rushing into these people, because his fight is not against these 20,000 people that gather together in a theater. It's against the spirit thing. And Paul knows who he is, and he knows the authority that he carries. So he wants to run into that theater. It doesn't matter what the mindset is of these 20,000 people. He knows who is behind this mindset. He, know, he knows who's behind the culture of what they're releasing and what they're singing. And Paul wants to rush in there to go and state the truth. Okay? And that's why he writes to this church, the church of Ephesians, that the wrestle, wrestle is not against flesh and blood. He names principalities and powers and all these, all these things in the heavenly places. Because um, the, the city of Ephesus, there was big, big warfare in the spirit going on because of this temple of worship that was raised up in the, um, for the Ephesians. You'll actually see that Paul writes in the, in the first book of Corinthians, he says, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32. It is in your notes, but I'm not there now. Um, I think it's there where he says that he fought beasts in Ephesus. Okay? So Paul had some, some tough spiritual warfare things while he was in Ephesus. Okay. So in the book of Daniel, 
we see that there's a prince referenced over a certain region while Daniel was, was praying. Okay, so we're going to read another long passage. I want you to turn to Daniel with me. <clears throat> Daniel is just after Ezekiel. If you don't know, I don't see you guys turning there. I hope you're there on your Bibles. On your apps. Okay, Daniel 10, verse, verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he's, can I just stop there? A lot of times we pray for people and they start shaking and they say it's unbiblical. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Again, sometimes I say, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to leave it there. I'm just throwing it out there. It wasn't one of you, okay? Just, so I'm not, this is not something against you. And then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So when, when was Daniel's prayer heard? It's not a trick question. You just, we just read it. On the first day. The moment that Daniel prayed, it was heard. Okay? But the fact that he mentions on the first day means that it's been a couple of days since he's prayed. Okay, I have come because of your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So now he, he gives reference to how long Daniel has been praying and how long Daniel has been waiting for an answer, for a breakthrough. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Just to pause there. You'll see that the Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is the chief prince of God. Okay? They don't believe that he's the son of God. They don't believe that he is God. They believe that he is one of the well, that he is the chief prince of God. That's what, well, that's what they believe and that's what their Bible says. So if you want to ever go into a dispute with them, you take them to this scripture and you show them that Michael was one of the chief princes of God. So if they say that Jesus is the chief prince, then it's not, it's not true because the Bible actually referenced that there's a couple. Jesus is not the only one according to them. All right, anyway, sidetracked it. One of the chief princes came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So first of all, he mentions prince, and then he mentions kings, okay? So it's, it's very evident that Daniel has been praying and while Daniel has been praying, the heavens heard his prayer, and the Lord sends an angel, which is a messenger. That's the name for angel, messenger. He sends a messenger to Daniel to answer his prayers. But in this answer, in this messenger going to, to Daniel, he can't seem to get through to Daniel because there's a wrestle in the spirit. Our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and princes of the air. Okay, so... There's a wrestle happening in the spirit for 21 days. And in this time, Daniel is still praying. He didn't stop praying. He's still praying. He's still wrestling. And his prayers actually mobilize one of the chief princes, Michael, to go and help this angel. And as soon as Michael comes, this angel actually references and says that he wasn't only wrestling against one prince, in Persia, but against kings of Persia. So we see that there's a whole lot of principalities over the area of Persia that are influencing, demonic influences, that are influencing this region. And as Daniel is praying, these demonic influences are, are blocking his prayers, the answers of his prayers to come, to come through. And now I have come, verse 14, now I have come to make you understand that what will happen to your people in the latter days? For the vision refers to many days yet to come. 
And when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overflowed me, and I have retained to strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me, nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me, and he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. The word of the Lord strengthens you in times of weakness. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you that I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Okay, so I think you know the, the context, and I think you know why I went into this, this part of Scripture. But what Paul is saying in Ephesians 6 verse 12 is shown to us in the book of Daniel 10, so that we can have just an, have an idea of how these things work. That every time we go into a region, we find a demonic force over that region. And every region have a, has a different demonic force. So over every town, for example, you'll see a different sphere of influence over that town. In Middleburg, for instance, we've, I've been living here for 10 years now, so obviously I've noticed what's going on in Middleburg. In Middleburg, there's a huge principality reigning over the marriages of this town. And that's why Middleburg has the worst um, or the highest divorce rate in South Africa because there's a principality, a demonic force that is attacking marriages over this town. If you go into another town, you'll see a different problem standing up. If you go into another town, you'll see a different problem standing up. Most of the times, actually all of the times, these things can only be there because they are allowed to be there. Okay, so they are there because of agreement. They are there because of rituals. They are there because of things spoken. They are there because of um, sacrifices that have, that have been made. They are there because of spiritual witchcraft stuff, satanic stuff, demonic stuff. They are there because people allow them to be there. Okay. Anyway, so in the book of Mark, we read about the disciples facing a storm while Jesus was sleeping in the boat. I want you to go there so that we can just read that as well, another scripture. There's a reason why we're in scripture a lot today, so that the scripture can talk and not me. The moment that we read, so what we're referencing to is Mark 4, verse 35 to 41. It's a part where Jesus tells his disciples to get into the boat so that they can go to, over to the other side. I think this was referenced by Tarsus yesterday as well. And in that time, a storm comes, Jesus is sleeping, and they, awake, they wake Jesus up so that, you know, Lord, don't you care that we are going to die? Like, do something. And Jesus quiets the boat. Now, there's a whole sermon in that. I don't want to go into that sermon now. What I do want to go in is the, is the following that many scholars, many biblical scholars, believe that the reason why they faced a storm on their way, let's just read this, okay? Um, so, on the same day, verse 35, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Where is the other side? Um, chapter 5, verse 1 says, tells us where the other side is, the country of the Gadarenes. Okay, so Jesus and his disciples are on their way to the Gadarenes. And many biblical scholars believe that there was a storm that awakened um, over, this, over the, the ocean, 
while Jesus and his disciples was going into that region because of the spiritual principality that reigned over the area of Gadara. Okay, so the Gadarenes are the people, referencing the people that stay in the city called Gadara. Okay? Um, so if you know the story, verse, uh, chapter 5 from verse 1 to about verse 20, um, tells us about this demoniac that lives in the tombs, that cuts himself, that people can't approach him, that has amazing powers. And Jesus actually goes to meet that man. And many biblical scholars believe that because of the fact that Jesus had an assignment to go to this man to set him free, that the principality that reigned over Gadara, and specifically the principalities, because there was a legion inside of this man, a legion referring to over 2,000 demons, was in this man, that this, these demons and the principality over that area actually tried to stop Jesus from getting there. But Jesus didn't care at all. He was sleeping on his journey there. Okay, so we would go into a region and know, like, let, we're, I'm referencing Turkey because we're going to Turkey next week, okay? So we're going to Turkey. There's a massive Islamic principality reigning over Turkey. And the moment that we think we're going there, we're like, oh, you know, we're going into this thing. We need to be vigilant. We need to, you know, we need to keep our eyes open. We need discernment. Jesus was sleeping on his way there. Didn't care. And, and when the storm came up, the disciples was afraid. But Jesus wasn't. And he walks out and he just says, peace, be still. And the next moment, we see that they're there, and this is what happens. I just want to read the first six verses so that we can speak on, on, on what happens there. Okay. So then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. So here's this, this principality. Okay, here's this, this demon-possessed man who's probably hosting this principality. Over 2,000 demons inside of him. Now, I don't know if you've done deliverances. Um, I think the most demons that I've driven out of a person was three. Three demons, not 2,000. 2,000 demons is a lot. And while 2,000 demons are inside of this man, obviously making him senile, making him crazy, turning him into something that goes and lives among the tombs, among dead people, because that's what devils do, they kill you, they come to kill, steal, and destroy, the moment that they see Jesus walking into that region, they don't try and fight him. They don't try and jump him. They don't, they don't try and, and, and push him out and scream at him and, and rebuke him to go away. Their response is worship him because that's the Jesus that we worship. That's the Jesus that sends us out. And the moment that we go in the mandate and the authority of Jesus, we don't go in there with fear, we go in there with the authority of love. Because Jesus walks into that place and he loves that person. He loves that guy. He goes towards that guy. He goes and fetch him. No one wants to have anything to do with him. Everyone casts him out. He can't be in the city. He's among the tombs. And Jesus goes there. 
to him. Okay? So look what happened when the Son of Man walked into that region. This man was dwelling among the tombs until the resurrection and the life walked in. No one could bind him until the real strong man walked in. He broke the chains, but the demonic chains over his life was broken when the chain breaker walked in. In verse 6, it says that the demons worshipped him. And if you read verse 5, uh, verse 10, let's, let's read verse 10 quickly so that you can see. The moment that they knew that Jesus was going to cast them out, look at what they did. Okay? And also he begged him, so they're begging Jesus earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Why not? Because they're the principality of that country. They're the principality of that region. And now they're begging Jesus, Lord, this, this is our domain. This is where we have authority. This is where we're exercising our influence. This is where we're influencing the minds of the people. Please don't send us out here. We've got a right to be here. And Jesus says, okay, go into the pigs, which is probably worse than anything else. Okay. So why did we, why did we read those, those scriptures? We were in Ephesians 6. We went to Acts 19. We went to Daniel 10. We went to Mark 4 and Mark, Mark 5. It's just to give us some, some perspective of how these things work. Okay, these things do not give us the full picture, but it gives us an idea of the fact that we can see that there's different ranks. It talks about princes, it talks about kings, it talks about regions, it talks about areas, it talks about cities and nations. So there's, there's ranks, there's regions, there's different influences and different spheres. There's fighting going on between them and against the angels. And we also see how they respond to Jesus. Okay, And that's why I, I took you into these places, into these scriptures, so that you can have an idea that the moment that you walk into a region, okay, a lot of you guys just came back from Swaziland, there would have been things that you noticed while you were in Swaziland. There would have been things that you experienced while you were in Swaziland. There might even have been dreams while you were there, which you just jugged off and thought, oh, that's just a stupid dream, but it might have been a demonic dream. Okay. One of, one of the things that happens in Turkey, and it's something that all the missionaries testify about, is sexual immoral dreams while you're there. Things that just happen. These dreams. And if you're not vigilant in the spirit, if you don't have discernment, you'll think that, oh, these dreams, just, you know, it's just a dream, it just happened. But you're actually being attacked in your dreams, so you will be distracted so that you will feel disqualified, so that you will feel dirty, you know? And if when the moment that you feel dirty, you don't feel worthy. And if you don't feel worthy, then you won't go and pray like you're supposed to pray, or you won't be on your assignment like you're supposed to be on your assignment. So the enemy just comes and, and distracts you. So there'll be little distractions, things that happen that we normally see as, that's ah, normal, it just happens, which are demonic, which is trying to derail you, which is trying to just get you off of your assignment. Just get you off of your mindset. These things happen, okay? So how do we respond? What is our response? What is the spiritual warfare response from our side concerning these things? Well, obviously, first of all, we start off in Ephesians again. Ephesians 6, verse 14 to 18. I'm not going to do a broad um, exegesis on this. Um, I think... Tash has covered it very good yesterday as well. Um, so I'll just reference it, okay? Ephesians 6, verse 14 to 18. It's important for us to wear the full armor of God. Now, guys, please listen to me. Like, I hear Christians uh, making statements like, yeah, you know, they wake up every morning, and every morning when they take put on their own clothes, they stand in front of the mirror, and then they put on the armor of God, and then they're ready. I'm like, oh, Jesus, help them. Seriously. Like, if you, if you want to 
put on the armor of God in front of a mirror, but you have no idea what the helmet of salvation is, what the belt of truth is, what the sword of the spirit is, or the shield of faith is, and how to use these things. Putting on that armor is not going to help you. This is not, this is not a children's thing. Okay, we, we, we learn this in, in children's church, and this is not a, this is a kinderspielig. Okay, this is actually something that we live out. This is actually something that is a part of our lives. And when it is a part of our lives, and when it is a part of who we are, then we have the armor of God on. Okay, so let's read the armor of God. Stand, therefore. Don't run away. <laughs> Stand, therefore. So when I say this as well, you'll notice that there's no armor at the back. All the armor is in front. There's no armor at the back. Why? Because we don't run away. God hasn't designed us to run away. He's designed us to stand. So stand. Okay? Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. What does that mean? It means that there's a revelation inside of your heart of the truth of Jesus, of the truth of His Word, of the truth of His revelation, and you're actually living that out. Truth is a part of who you are. It means that truth comes and exposes lies inside of your life, things that you believe of God that are lies, things that you believe um, of religion that are lies, things that you believe of the church that are lies. Truth actually comes and exposes that and teaches you the right things. You're wearing the belt of truth. It means that every time the enemy comes to you with a lie, you know it's a lie. Why? Because you have the belt of truth on. Every time there's deception, you know it's deception. Why? Because you have the belt of truth on. Truth shows when it's a lie. Truth shows when it is deception. If you don't wear this belt, if you don't have truth, you're not going to know when something is a lie. You'll walk into a region, you'll see people acting a certain way, and you'll think that it's okay. Oh, that's a culture thing. Oh, shame. That's a, that's a weird culture. But the moment that you wear truth, you'll see that this thing is actually demonic. What they're doing there is actually something that is demonic. It's influenced by demonic thinking, ways of thinking, okay? So you need to wear the belt of truth. And like Dasha said yesterday, who is truth? Jesus is truth, okay? So you're wearing Jesus. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness is something that is, so it's protecting your heart, okay? Out of the heart springs the wellspring of life. Righteousness is something that we cannot obtain by ourselves. It's not something that is, that is obtained by works. It's something that is obtained by the blood of Jesus and what he's done on the cross. We are the righteousness of God because of the blood of the Lamb, it says that in the Word as well, 2 Corinthians 5. So the moment that we're in Christ, His blood comes and He makes us the righteousness of God. The moment that we are of the righteousness of God, it means that we are marked. My heart is marked by the righteousness of Jesus. And the moment that I walk into a place, the moment that I stand in a place and someone looks at me, they see the righteousness of Jesus. It speaks about an authority. It speaks about, it's about someone who has submitted to someone else, who comes underneath the leadership of someone else. That's what this righteousness is actually speaking about. The moment that we say, we the breastplate of righteousness. Having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Who is peace? Jesus is peace, right? But we have shoes, the readiness of the shoes of, of the gospel. You know, it says in Isaiah, and Paul references it as well in Corinthians, how lovely are the feet of those who bring good news. Isaiah actually references it to Jesus, and Paul actually references it to us who goes. So it's a beautiful thing. The very first feet that were beautiful were the feet of Jesus. Now that I'm in Jesus, now that I'm standing in Jesus, Paul actually proclaims and says that my feet are beautiful as well. It's not because I'm fancy. It's because I'm standing in him. Okay. Um, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Faith 
is knowing when no one else knows. Faith is seeing when no one else sees. Faith is the evidence of the substance of things hoped for. I've preached about this, so I just want to remind you on this, that faith actually has a spiritual weight. The Bible says that faith is the substance. Substance is something that has weight, that has value. So in the spirit, faith actually carries weight that pulls down. Okay? So the moment that I have faith in God, it means that there's a substance in the spirit, that the spirit actually, the spirit realm sees and recognizes. They see that substance. And I know that I can quench the fiery darts, the lies, the deceptions, the distractions, the whatever the enemy wants to throw my way. I can actually stop it through having faith in who Jesus is. It means that I have faith in the fact that he is the healer. And when there comes a fiery dart of sickness, I can quench that fiery dart by believing and having faith in the fact that he is the healer, just to make it practical, okay? Good. And then take the helmet of salvation. As the moment that we speak about the helmet of salvation is the moment that we make a proclamation that our mind is different from what it was. We're not thinking like we thought before. We have a new mind. He's actually given us the mind of Christ. He's given us the mind of Christ. The proclamation of that means that we have the ability to think like Jesus thought. Before that, we didn't have the ability. But he made us a new creation. He's given us the mind of Christ. Now I have the ability to think like Jesus thought. Think about this, okay? It's only possible for us to live like Jesus lived and do like Jesus did if we think like Jesus thought. It's the only way. And he's given us that ability. So the moment that we say that we have the helmet of salvation, it's not this symbolic thing that we're putting on my head. It's actually a specific mindset, a specific wineskin that the Lord has given me that I can go into with. I, I, I know that when there's a contrary thought, when there's a worldly thought, where a principality wants to come and influence my thought life, I can actually take those things captive and make it obedient to Christ because I have the helmet of salvation on. He's given me the ability. Okay. Good. And then, the sword of the Spirit, don't think I have to say too much of that because the Word says, which is the Word of God, okay? We need the Word of God. And then, obviously, I know you know this, I hope you know this, that praying in tongues is part of the armor of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful, so even my eyes are a part of the armor of God, so that I can see to this end with all perseverance and supplication with all the saints. We're wearing the armor of God with all the saints, not alone. We're not supposed to do this thing alone. We're supposed to do this thing with someone else, with all the saints. That's why we're a body. Okay. okay, so we respond by standing strong. We respond by taking on the armor of God. Second thing in how we respond. We respond with worship. We respond with worship. You know this, Psalm 22 verse 3 says, You are holy, enthroned in the praises of your people. God, so the moment that we worship God, the moment that we praise God, He is being enthroned. What does that mean? It means that we're putting Him on the throne. We're declaring that He is the King. We're declaring that He is the worthy one. The moment that we enthrone Him, it means that whatever was enthroned before Him has to be dethroned. Whatever was sitting on the throne that did not have the right to sit on the throne, we're dethroning that thing and enthroning Jesus. And we all, we just do that through worship. So we do, worshiping Jesus, 
loving Jesus, declaring who He is, bringing our praises towards Him, bringing our love towards Him, and, and automatically what happens is the principality that is on the throne is being removed off of the throne, and Jesus is putting on, He's, he's sitting on the, on the throne just because of worship. Now, I don't know if you know, um, we know this because Travis mentioned this and Randy mentioned this at the conference where we were now as well, that the biggest prayer and worship movement in the world is not the Christian movement. The biggest prayer and worship movement in the world is Islam. They pray and sing five times a day, corporately, not individually, corporately, five times a day. There are more people, Islamic people, gathering every day for prayer and worship around the world than they would ever, not, no, not that they would ever, at this moment, that there is Christians gathering, worshiping, and praying towards God. Islam is the highest worship and prayer movement in the world at this moment. I don't know about you, but that provokes me. It provokes me that there are people worshiping a dead God, worshiping a demonic principality five times a day, bringing their affection, bringing their attention, bringing their time towards this demonic principality where they're supposed and made to bring it to Jesus. That provokes me. So the moment that we go into a region like Turkey, 99.8% Muslim, the moment that we walk in there and they are exalting Allah five times a day through prayer and worship, and we walk in there and we walk into a prayer room underneath the street, literally, underneath, go into that prayer room, it's small, and we raise up an altar, we come there and we raise up a bigger altar than, than the Islamic people will ever raise up. The size of the altar is determined by the size of the sacrifice. And there's, there's no way, there's no way that religion can raise up or give a bigger sacrifice than love can. There's no way. And the moment that we as lovers of God walk into that place and in our love put ourselves on that altar and pour ourselves out on that altar. We're raising up bigger altars than the Islamic people can ever can. It means that for that moment, something happens in the spirit realm that we have no idea, no clue of. But for a moment, for a glimpse, there's a bigger weight in the Christian principalities, the Christian air, if you can call it that, than there is in the Islamic powers, the Islamic air. I remember, I think I told you this, the first time that we went there last year in April, we were worshiping. Courtney was actually just singing to, to the Lord and worshiping. We were praying like we were praying now. And as I was praying there, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me that our worship is purifying the air. So I go to Connor, I say to Connor, Jesus, Connor, this is so beautiful. I just experienced that Jesus tells me, Holy Spirit is telling me that as we're worshiping, as we're praying, that, that the Holy Spirit, Jesus is purifying the air, the spiritual air. And the moment that I say that, Courtney couldn't have heard me because she was there where Magda is, and it's loud. Courtney starts singing, you're purifying the air, you're purifying the air, you're purifying the air. That's what Jesus does the moment that we start worshiping. Okay, so we respond by worship. <clears throat> Third way, how we respond. We respond with prayer, okay? Referencing back to Daniel, Daniel didn't stop when he didn't get an answer. He continued praying. And his prayers actually brought the breakthrough for the answer. So we keep on praying, we keep on pressing in until our prayers become breakthrough prayers. Okay, we respond with prayer. We live by the revelation of Scripture. Exactly just like Jesus withstood the enemy with Scripture when he was tempted in the wilderness, that is exactly what we do. 
we withstand the enemy with Scripture. We withstand the enemy with the Word of God. When we walk into a region, we quote Scripture, we sing Scripture, we pray Scripture, we release Scripture everywhere we go. We live it, okay? I do not open up my Bible to Psalm 91 and go to sleep. My father-in-law, he has this, this joke. You know, just, it offends people, so I'm going to say it. Maybe it offends you. That's okay. He says, you will open up your Bible in Psalm 91, and the devil will come and sit on that Bible and come and mock you. Opening up the Bible when the Bible has not been opened up here helps you nothing. There's, there's, no, there's no spiritual significance of opening up to Psalm 91 and thinking that you're safe for the night. Okay? This, this is something that comes here. And because it's here, it comes out here. And the moment that it's here and it comes out here, it has power. Luke 10, verse 17 to 20. This is the 70, Jesus sends them out, just like he's going to send you out. Jesus sends the 70 out. They come back to Jesus. They rejoice. They say to him, Lord, even the demons are subject they are subject to us in your name, Lord. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus is not very impressed. Okay, he's the one that kicked out Satan from, light, from the heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus puts a way greater value in our salvation than in our spiritual warfare, than in us being able to withstand the enemy, than contrary to us being saved. Jesus puts a way bigger emphasis on the fact that we're saved, on our ability to withstand the enemy. And he's like, guys, it's nothing. That's who you are now. It's your identity. And you're sons of God now. This is what the Son of God does. The Son of God walks into a place, delivers people from the enemy, delivers people from the hands of the enemy. This is who you are now. You're sons of God. It's because of your salvation, not because of who you are. Know your identity. The sons of, Sh of Shiva... I think you know that. Acts 19, again, you can go and read this. I'm not going to read it for time's sake um, because I just want to share some, some couple of stories. So for time's sake, I'm not going to read this, but in Acts 19, verse 13 to 18, you'll read of the sons of Shiva. And uh, these were Jewish exorcists, seven of them, that went to um, exercise or deliver people from demonic oppressions. And they come there and say, in the name of of Jesus that Paul preached, we exercise you. And the enemy, the devil, or the demon, replies and says, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, who are you? Okay, so, Jesus they obviously know because he created them. Paul they know because Paul carries a spiritual authority that God has given them, given him. He's wrestled with beasts, okay? So they know Paul. They have no idea who these guys are, because they don't have an identity of Jesus. If, same thing that I said earlier, if the name of Jesus doesn't mark you here, if Jesus doesn't win your heart, you will never be able to win anything else, spiritually speaking. Okay? You're not going to win an enemy, a, a fight against the enemy, if Jesus hasn't conquered your heart yet. If Jesus hasn't conquered your heart, you're not fighting against the enemy, you're fighting with the enemy. Know your identity. Know who you are. Go and listen to yesterday's sermon if you want to know who you are. And then the last one, live by the revelation of who Jesus is. Guys, if you've seen him, if you know him, if you know what the scriptures say about him, then you'll know that there's nothing that you have to fear. You'll know that he isn't intimidated 
Jesus isn't looking at the Islamic power over Turkey and thinking, oh, Yanak, I'm sending you into a losing battle. Hi, shame, buddy. But thank you that you will go. I see you in your rock. It's awesome. Sorry, I just, that's not his heart. Okay, he's one. There's nothing above him. There's nothing that can dethrone him. Nothing that has, has the right to come and lay claim to his throne. Nothing. Jesus is above everything. He created everything. And these things coming against us came out of Jesus' mouth. He created them. So get a revelation of who he is. Get a revelation of his love for you. you you've heard that scripture that the love of God, the perfect love of God drives out all fear. Okay? Have you meditated on that? Why? Why? Why does the perfect love of God drive out all fear? I mean, Jesus loves me, but I still have fear in my heart. I, I, if I'm honest, there's things that I fear. Why? It means that I don't have that revelation of love in that area yet. So this is what the scripture means, okay? This is what it means. If you have a full revelation of how much he loves you, you will never fear anything because you know how much he loves you. If you really have this revelation of the fact that nothing can, can grasp you, can take you, snatch you out of his hand, one time, um, so, okay, some testimonies. Anyway, just back, live by the revelation of Jesus. The scripture, I gave it in your notes, so just go through, through those notes, go through the scripture, meditate on those scriptures. Make sure that you get the revelation of who Jesus is. So sometimes spiritual attacks and spiritual warfare happens in the spirits, and sometimes it happens in the natural. Sometimes you need to, you face things in the natural, which you need to sort out and which you need to fight, and other times you fight things in the spiritual. So let me give you some, some examples. Um, in 20, 2011, someone broke into our house. We were living in Standerton, and to make a long story short, I'm not going to give you all the gory detail, but that guy stabbed me um, with a knife. He stabbed me in my face um, right here. The knife went in here, cut open my whole nose, went into my cheekbone, so it was open like this, and then he also stabbed me inside of my chest, okay? Um, and I knew and knew, just knew, that the enemy tried to take my life that night. Just knew it. It was a spiritual warfare thing that I experienced in the natural, okay? So my wrestle still isn't against that guy that tried to stab me, okay? Um, if you want the details, then ask me for coffee and I'll tell you the whole story. Um, the one time, I think most of you know, the time where bees came over to our house and killed four of our dogs. Okay, so I'm playing golf, my phone rings, my phone, my wife is phoning me, she's hysteric. Uh, that time we didn't have any kids, it was 2021, 2021. We loved our dogs very, very much, like honestly very much. They were like our kids to us, especially our Yorkies that we had. And a swarm of bees just came over to our house and started stinging them. And we had five dogs. They killed four of them instantly. Um, and I knew the moment that I walked into that place, I knew that there was spiritual witchcraft against me and, me and Mariska. And it was something that we fought in the, in the physical. It, it manifested in the physical. Okay? So it was something that we had to stand firm in and go to, I had to take to Jesus. Okay? So that's physical things. So sometimes spiritual warfare happens in the physical. The previous time in August when I went to Turkey, I was sick for, we were there for, geez, I can't remember the exact times. We were away for 12 days. And I think we were in Turkey for seven of those 12 days. Okay. And um, for all seven days while I was in Turkey, I was sick. All seven days. I had running, runny stomach. And I could drink any medicine that there was, Imodiums, alles. I drank everything. It just didn't stop. Okay? And I knew it was a spiritual thing because I didn't eat anything weird. 
and I ate what everyone else ate, okay? Um, so that's where it manifests physically. Then sometimes it manifests spiritually, okay? So for instance, um, one night when I was sleeping in um, um, Zierest, Zierest uh, we were sleeping in the hostel, and there was a story um, in the hostel of a, a lion man walking around in the hostel. They called him Ratau. Okay, that's a story. So the, when the kids told us a story, we were like, oh, whatever. It's like, you know, kinder stories. Right? So the night I, I went, to, went to sleep and I woke, woke up and I heard a growl. I was like, what the heck is that? And as I turned around, this Ratau thing is over my bed looking at me with his red eyes, um, trying to eat me, okay? And I just go, oh, you're real, wow, that's crazy. And I turn around and I just keep on sleeping, okay? Um, that was my very first experience with a, with a demonic. And I knew in that, I knew that the Lord was, was teaching me authority in that moment, Okay? Was I scared? I was scared, but I wasn't going to let him know that I was scared. Honestly, I was really scared. But I was just like, you're not going to know that I'm scared. So I was just like, yeah, I'm going to slow, okay? Okay? Um, That was the one. Then in, in uh, our house, I can't even remember if it was here. In, in this house, we've experienced a lot of times, but in, in basically in all the houses that we stayed with, it's happened a lot of times where um, demons would manifest in our room. Um, and stand there. Sometimes they'll try and say something. Sometimes they'll, they'll try and do something. Um, and the moment that I see them, I'll just rebuke them and tell them, listen, you, you don't have any authority in this room. You will go away. Um, and most of the times, you just see the silhouette, and it's misfigured things, beings. It's not like a person standing there. It's like a, the one time it was like a Buddha thingy, standing, standing there like this eye. Okay, next to next to my bed, and because you see right away that this thing is misformed, and you see that this thing, so you know it's a demon, and you know ugh, seriously, you know what can I do? Make him kill So you just straight away just rebuke the thing, and it just just goes away. But the the one time I was really scared, and I I told it to my wife. I really really had a fright. Because of what happened to us in 2011, um, when the guy broke into our house, he stood over us um, at our bed. So I woke up in 2011. I woke up because the dogs barked, and when I turned around, this guy was standing with my cell phone. I had a Blackberry. He, he was standing with, his, with my cell phone in his hand, looking at me like this. I was lying there, okay? Physical guy, so he ran away, chased, he stabbed me, okay? So later in this house, um, I woke up one night, and there was a man standing over Mariska like this. Jeez, and I lost it, right? Because I thought exactly like in 20, 2011. So I kicked this guy. Like Mariska's, I'm sleeping, Mariska's here, the guy's standing that side. I kicked this guy like over this, like <laughs> Jackie Chan, kick him. The duvet, the duvet cover starts flying over. I kick over the light, everything. Mariska sits up straight. She's like, what the heck just happened? I'm like, Leafy, alles is okay. Alles is okay. Don't worry. Alles, alles okay. And the moment that I switched on the light, I saw that there's no one there. So I knew that there was a spiritual being standing next to Mariska. But it was manifesting in the form of a man. And that was, I, I had a fright that, that night. Yeah. And then after that, obviously, you take these things to the Lord, and you're like, Lord, what the heck, you know? And in that, the Lord just teaches you things. He teaches you how to respond to these things. He teaches you what to pray. He teaches you spiritual authority. Um, like one thing that, I'm, that I ask the Lord is like, Lord, I've never seen an angel before, except in visions, but with my physical eyes. Like these things that I'm just talking about, I saw with my physical eyes, Okay. Another thing that I saw with my physical eyes was uh, we had a prophetic conference with my father-in-law the one time, and um, I think it was in 2018. There was a, a guy that was addicted to drugs, and he was standing here, and my father-in-law was praying, and I was standing with him, supporting him in prayer, and this guy came around and stood there for, for prayer, and I looked at him, and I knew that there was a demonic influence over him, 
So I went and I stood behind him and my father-in-law turned around. And the moment that he turned around, he looked at this guy and he walked straight towards him. And he said, Spirit of Python, I rebuke you in Jesus. And the moment that he said, Spirit of Python, I saw a python coming out of the guy's spine, wrapping around his throat, coming in like this, trying to bite my, my father off, sword with my physical eyes, and, and then it was gone. So I've seen these things with my physical eyes, not, in, not as a vision, not as something that I'm daydreaming, like with my physical eyes. I'm like, Lord, why haven't I seen angels with my physical eyes? Like I've seen them in visions, you know, that's, I've seen them in dreams, but I've never seen them in, in my, with my physical eyes. And I really just think that the, I haven't got an answer in that, but I really just think that the Lord is teaching me authority. You know, he's, he's, re, he's allowing certain things to come so that he can teach me authority over these things. Um, I'm just thinking of this, if there's another testimony that I can share. No, I think I'm going to stop there. Okay. So... Why, why am I sharing these things? I'm sharing these things to, just to show you and tell you that these things are real, okay? The first person that I had to deliver, oh, I get my poly off, like honestly, um, because I was new in the Lord. I think I was like two years in, and you only hear about these things, and you know that the Lord gives you authority, and he knows that he wants you to go and deliver you know, people from, from demons. But the moment that it happens, these things manifest, and you didn't expect it, yes, crook. Yeah, you get a fright. I was praying for this guy who was bigger than me. Honestly, he's like this size, big guy. We were in uh, Lady Brandt, if you even know where that is, in Lady Brandt. And I pray for, for this guy, and this guy's normal, you know, soft teddy bear guy. Um, and I'm praying for him, and I'm closing my eyes because I'm praying for him. And all of a sudden, I hear this guy growling at me. I'm like, what? And when I open up my eyes, this guy's face is like right here. And his drool is like coming out here, and his teeth, and he's like growling at me. He's trying to bite me, this guy. And I'm like, whoa. I have no idea how to handle this, so I run to my leader, who was my team leader. I'm like, I'm like oh, I was like, stand still in Jesus' name. I run to my... <laughs> I run to my leader, I get him, I'm like, dude, you need to come and help me, this thing is manifesting, I have no idea what to do, so I come to him, and he just comes, and he gives this guy a hug, and this guy is delivered, he just didn't even pray, you know, and in that, I realized, that, but that was the very first time that I had to do with deliverance in this, and so, sometimes you get a fright, guys, I mean, Daniel was afraid when he saw angels, I look in the Bible, every time there was this spiritual manifestation of things, people were afraid when these things happened. And it's so important in that moment to come back in your right mind, to come back in faith, to respond in your identity, and not allow faith, uh, fear to overwhelm you in that, in that time. And the easiest way to do that is to pray in the Spirit. It's the easiest way. Just go and pray in your tongue straight away. That's how you respond. Pray in your tongue, step back, just keep your eyes on, on this thing, and then just respond on how Jesus wants you to, to respond. Okay? All right. Let us, let us stop there. So, obviously, spiritual warfare is a real thing. Um, you guys will definitely witness some things and face some things when you go into the nations and when you are sent. But the amazing thing is that we are on the winning side. I'm sorry. We're on the winning side. Um, we don't have to have fear. We have authority. And the moment that you walk into a region while you are sent out, you know that you are commissioned to be there. You have the right to be there. The team that was in Swaziland, you had the right to be in Swaziland because Jesus sent you into Swaziland. We have the right to walk into Turkey because Jesus is sending us into, the, into Turkey. The moment that he gives that command, there's a mandate. And the moment that there's a mandate, there's an authority. And you just walk in that authority. And let me just say this. The moment that that authority in your heart turns over to pride, you're going to get a surprise. Because God resists the proud. So, you can not clap by the moon and you can clap by the earth. God resists the proud. The verschil is net, a demon gaan jou klap om jou seer te maak, en God gaan jou klap in liefde. He'll just bring you back to, you, to humble yourself, and to get your heart straight. 
but a demon won't have that grace. <laughs> okay, so don't allow pride to stand up in your heart. We go in there with authority, but we go in there with meekness, and we go in there with humility, and we go in there knowing who the one, who the one is that gives us authority, and who we're resting in, and who we're abiding in. Um, that's what happens when we go there. Okay, so, crux van die saak, make sure that you prepare yourself well, make sure that you spend time in prayer, make sure that you spend time with Jesus, praying into what's, what's coming, praying into scenarios, praying into whatever Holy Spirit is awakening in your heart, praying into things that you see in Jesus' eyes while, you, while you're praying for the trip that you're going in, asking Him to give you a wineskin, asking Him to give you a certain specific thing to go and do, like the Lord told me, to go and release Psalm 24 while we are there, um, not the Jacob generation thing, the, the later, um, the um, lift up your heads, or your gates, be you open up wide, you open, you, you open doors, let the King of Glory enter in. That's what I'm, I have to go and release there this time when, I, when I'm in Turkey. So that's going to be something that I'm going to release in the prayer room. It's going to be something that I'm going to release in my hotel room. It's going to be something that I release whenever I pick up a guitar and sing. That's what I'm going to sing, that the King of Glory would enter in those place, into that place. That's what the Lord is commissioning me to go and do. Um, and fast. Fasting is not a, um, a spiritual quick fix. Okay? Fasting is allowing the Holy Spirit to give you the right wineskin for what is to come and allowing Him to come and break down the flesh so that you can walk into that place with the Spirit, in the Spirit. Yeah, that's, what, that's what fasting does. And then get people around you to start praying with you like we have people praying with us now already because we know this is a spiritual battle. Okay? As Islam is the biggest worship movement in the world, and we're going there to worship, <laughs> they, don't, they don't like it. Okay? That, that spirit, that principality doesn't like it. So we need prayer partners, partners in that. But we're not going there in fear, even though we have prayer partners, even though we're vigilant, even though we're praying, even though we are not naive or ignorant of his devices. We're not going there with fear. We're going there with authority and joy. Joy is one of the greatest weapons while you're in the nations. Joy. Okay. In his presence is fullness of joy. Flight, flight, my story aside. Come on, bed. Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that your word is powerful. We thank you that your word carries a weight. We thank you that your word is a two edged sword. And we thank you, Lord, that. You have chosen us, that you have commissioned us, and that you're sending us out. And that we can go in the might and in the spirit of your power. Lord, thank you for teaching us authority. Thank you for teaching us what it means to stand. Teaching us what it means to wear the armor of God. And I pray, Lord, for deep encounters with you and deep encounters with the spiritual things for every one of us so that we can have true authority and know our authority in Jesus' name. I'm even praying for people's hearts here that are saying, Lord, I want to encounter like that. I also want to see my authority. I also want you to teach me my authority. I pray, Lord, that there would be encounters, um, demonic encounters, and that you would teach them and give them the tools and the wisdom and the discernment on how to handle these things and how to how uh, to react in this time and what to say, what to do. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your authority. Thank you that the battle has already been won because you have made a public spectacle of the principalities and the powers. You've disarmed them. You've defeated them. And we are walking in, in your power and in your commission. And we honor you for that. Oh, thank you that we can just pray and declare over everyone here tonight that you would protect our dreams tonight, that we would have godly dreams, um, that we would have godly visions. Um, thank you for peace over every heart. 
Thank you that we can come against fear now in the name of Jesus. And thank you that we can just declare that there would be a greater revelation of your love because of the love of God drives out all fear. And I declare that over every heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.